humanness of our time. Welcome to Free Thinking 101, brought to you by the Rationalist Society of St. Louis. Tonight we're going to once again delve into the area of philosophy with one of our most well-known well and respected guests, uh, Jeff Hornback. Jeff, tonight we're going to discuss George Santayana, one of the most uh, prominent American philosophers. What, what made Santayana so prominent in American philosophy? Well, probably not the quotation for which he is best known. Only the other day I heard somebody on one of the networks again quoting Santayana as saying that uh, those who fail to remember history are fated to repeat it. And you hear that in various forms. He said it in various forms. But few people realize that George Santayana was one of the most famous free-thinking, rationalist, atheist, materialist philosophers in the modern world. Uh, hence, he hasn't enjoyed the same popularity as somebody like William James, who willed himself to believe in God, even though his reason didn't give him grounds for it. You know, he, James invented this famous will to believe pragmatism, which is so popular. And even John Dewey, though he was, technically speaking, free thinking and atheistic, uh, made a mistake, I would say, of saying uh, that if he were to use the word God, he would mean by it the relation between the real and the ideal, or the actual and the ideal. Santayana was frank about this sort of thing. He said, uh, I'm an atheist. Uh, I uh, don't believe in disembodied spirits, or that sort of thing. And uh, uh, his part of his philosophy has largely been forgotten. Well, what kind of background did he have to b arrive at this well, position of atheism? Uh, Santiano is often referred to as a Spanish-American philosopher, and in that, in his case in particular, that's literally true. Uh, his father was a Spanish sea captain, and his mother, one of the Sturgis family, uh, a staid and prominent Boston, New England family. And uh, George was born in Spain, in 1863, but he grew up in Boston and went to Harvard and got his doctorate in philosophy there and taught there until he was a man of about 50. Uh, and uh, in his 50th year, uh, he retired from teaching and started living off a family trust <laughs> fund and just lived all over Europe, uh, spending his declining years in a Catholic nursing home in uh, in Rome. Yeah, well, that must have been rather ironic, I guess. I you know I, I read a little bit about Santayana mm -hmm. in preparation for this interview, and apparently, the uh, the priests and nuns were practically at his throat trying to uh, apply well, that, the sacraments right. to him uh, during his last days. At the age of, of seventy seven, uh, he went into the nursing home or boarding house. Really, it was more th more of that than a nursing home of the Blue Nuns in Rome. And uh, th the sisters, uh, he said, were always worrying about his soul's salvation. You know, poor Mr. Santayana, he isn't a Christian, he isn't saved. And uh, he, he asked his friends, including Daniel Corey, one of his biographers, whom I knew was a slightly older uh, fellow graduate student at Columbia, uh, he asked Dan Corey to watch over him in his final years to make sure that the nuns and the priests they called in uh, didn't pull any fast ones on him <laughs> <laughs> after he became unable to cope with things like that. And so Dan Corey swears that the stories about uh, Santayana's deathbed conversion or confession uh, 
uh, were entirely made up. There was nothing proven. Well, he probably just went in, into that uh, convent, you know, or into that uh, nursing home with the nuns for the wine. I guess that might have might have well, been. Well, it's funny that uh, he always, uh, as a man of at least half Catholic background, because his father is a fallen Catholic, a man who had rejected uh, religion and had dropped out of the Catholic Church. Uh, but indeed, he was Spanish and, and uh, very Catholic in the sense that he grew up in a Catholic culture. And so he always loved the cathedrals and the beauties of the old mythology, as he called it. But he said, it's not true. It's, it's just a myth and a very colorful story, if you keep that in mind. And uh, so... Uh, his old friend, uh, the philosopher Bertrand Russell, whom you discussed uh, very well one night recently on this program, uh, liked to say of Santayana, uh, you know, Santayana says there is no God, but Mary is his mother. <laughs> so uh, he lived in that world of, of reference to the basic Catholic background of the culture. And that led a great many people to uh, overlook the fact or even at times misrepresent the fact that Santiano was very explicit in his rejection of that kind of religion. Well, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you say, though, that that's sort of a danger that uh, people fall into sometimes in, in treating uh, the mythology which surrounds, I guess, actually constitutes religion if, uh, if they're not, uh, I guess, militant enough or disciplined enough in their in their portrayal of the religion as the mythology for which it is, people normally assume that you, you're reading more into the myth than, than you would like them to. You almost have to tell people explicitly that, you know, that this is really, you're treating this just as a myth, or they will assume that you are, have crossed the line into religionism. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I imagine the number of people watching this program uh, on television uh, would really be uh, kindred spirits with us but probably most of them have never done anything about it. Most people just go along. If they were born into a Catholic family, they go on being Catholics all their lives, maybe just for the great occasions of life, maybe just when they got baptized and maybe confirmed and married and then mm -hmm. buried. Uh, the same is true of Protestants, Jews, most of the great religions. A lot of people don't take them as seriously as we free-thinking people do. I, I mm. mean, I, I've often been told, oh, you just take religion too seriously. <laughs> people really don't mean it. Uh, well, I think that's too bad. If people allow the dogmatist to dictate what religion will be and just go along paying the bills and mm. conforming. Uh, and Santiano uh, would agree with us in that. He believed that uh, reason should harmonize or coordinate our lives. He was a man of great emotion, great poetry and passion, and he loved these stories of mythology and so forth. But he loved them as myths, mm -hmm. sometimes illustrating a moral point. And he liked to say that at one point in history, most of these myths were taken seriously. I mean, they were part of the yeah. natural background, a part of the culture. They were live. They were living myths. And what he really objected to was myths that can't any longer really be believed and yet are maintained and recited uh, solemnly by mm -hmm. people who go to the churches. Well, he really lived a pretty interesting life, especially the, the early part of his life. I guess the, peop the part most people in the United States are interested in, I suppose, are the, his era uh, when he lived in uh, Roxbury, apparently, mm -hmm. for a number of years during his youth right. with his mother. His, his, his father had apparently returned to Spain. And then he was very, although he wasn't very well off financially during this period, apparently he did have a, a uh, very, he was very, uh, uh, had pretty significant achievements in the academic world. He attended Harvard and uh, was one of the, the founders of the, the Harvard Lampoon magazine and was a, a cartoonist for that magazine. He, uh, he almost became an art artist. Mm -hmm. uh, he drew very well, painted a little bit. It was wonderful at design. He wrote good poetry. I would say he's probably not a great poet, but he wrote first-class poetry. Um, he wrote essays. He was, as you say, a campus reporter and editor. Uh, a brilliant student on campus. 
I've talked to old-time students of his. The late Rabbi Sammy Thurman of United Hebrew Temple here had studied under Santiana and William James and uh, George Herbert Palmer and the great absolute idealist Josiah Royce and Hugo Munsterberg. This was a faculty of philosophers at Harvard that is probably seldom if ever been equaled in any, in any university in the world. Well, Santiana in 1913 became not only a student but a colleague of these men. And uh, he taught uh, from 1913 uh, uh, on there at Harvard. So, uh, or rather, was that, wait a minute, that, that sounds more like the, the day he taught until 1913. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that thir 1913 would have been the year when he turned 50. Mm -hmm. So that um, he taught for many years there. And they said that though William James is somewhat more famous because he's, he appeals to people uh, bringing God in the back door after he's ruled him out on the basis of reason on the grounds that he needed him. Like Immanuel Kant, he said, I need to believe in God and therefore I'm going to because it makes me happy. Uh, you know, it makes my life whole. And Santayana wouldn't have any of that. Uh, so <clears throat> in that year, 1913, which is indeed the fateful year, uh, he decided to withdraw from his teaching and devote the rest of his life to travel and mm -hmm. writing and so forth. And he wrote many, many books. I have the full uh, uh, list here of his major books, but there were uh, 10 or 15 minor books, which you would add for a total of 35 or 40 books that he published during his long lifetime. And he was 88 going on 99, hmm. 88 going on 89 uh, when he died in 1952. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he sure lived a full life, but actually he, um, I, some people seem to view his, him as establishing sort of a a, um, a limit there for a certain school of philosophy. He, some people view him as being one of the more humane philosophers as opposed to more analytic philosophers. And I, I heard well, uh, some of them put him down for not being quite as technical in his philosophy as some of the mm -hmm. others were. Uh, because he wrote uh, in a very florid literary style. I rather like it. Some people find it a little too heavy and literary, and they say, well, that isn't philosophy, that's literature. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very poetic, and uh, it sounds almost as if, as some critics were saying, he was translating from Spanish <laughs> or from French uh, as he wrote his philosophy. But his first series of, of famous books were put out through Scribner's in 1905 and 6, uh, five in the series uh, on the life of reason. I have three of them here, uh, which have been reissued by Dover Publications in these colorful paperbacks. And he called the first one Reason in Common Sense. And people don't often think of everyday common sense life as being the life of reason, but he, he dwelt on that. He said, the way you pull your passions together, your interests, your values together, is the life of reason. Harmonize your life. And uh, then he did uh, reason in society. It's obvious, getting along with others and so forth. You need to be reasonable and need to use logic and weigh evidence and mm -hmm. so forth. And then, let's see, volume three is Reason and Religion, in which, again, he went into his uh, theory that uh, religion uh, is mythology. And what we call now our uh, science may be regarded in future centuries mm -hmm. as mythology by people who've learned a great deal more science. Mm -hmm. But he was for uh, leaving it to the scientists. So um, Reason and Art was the fourth in the series, and he said any operation that uh, tries to bring beauty to uh, the objects in life, the relations in life, is an art. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, though he was very knowledgeable in the fine arts, uh, he, he believed that there were many other arts in mm -hmm. life than the fine arts, and uh, he considered them all coordinated. 
Then the, the fifth volume, and the, the capstone of this, was his Reason in Science book. And uh, he said, actually, um, science is a projection of common sense. You see things, you see facts and truths, and you make logical, rational projections from those uh, and uh, guide your life by them. So that he became known for this series on, on the life of, of reason, uh, which was republished uh, by Dover, as I indicated, in mm -hmm. the 1980s, and is readily accessible. Yeah. Well, discussing his, his philosophy, the details of his philosophy for a moment, one of the uh, primary things it seems like uh, uh, Santiana picked up on that I, I can really sympathize with was this uh, re reaction to the tendency of some people, even some philosophers, to see an inevitable flow of progress. I guess it was very rampant at the time that uh, he was in his prime, around the, the turn, of, turn of the century, the, the Belle Epoque, and uh, a lot of uh, really revolutionary techno technological developments coming down the pike. Uh, people apparently felt that there was this inevitable onrush of uh, progress of, uh, of uh, just the way of life and philosophy and uh, the, the whole uh, human experience was somehow inevitably or irresistibly forced onward toward higher, higher levels and he really rejected this. He was very critical of people who, I think he used the terms, uh, see evolution everywhere. He, th he thought that there was really Devolution as well as <laughs> evolution. Yeah. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, he named among his favorite philosophers, of course his favorite was Aristotle as against Plato, mm. because he said even though Aristotle's science wasn't very advanced according to today's standards, or his standards even in Santayana's early life, uh, still Aristotle was a man who liked to base his philosophy on fact and then reason from it. Uh, whereas Plato uh, stress this real world of ideas. In other words, odd as it sounds to us, uh, for Platonist, the real world is the ideal world, the realm of mm. ideas and plans and forms, and the merely actual world, which Plato and his followers put down, uh, just kind of participated in a uh, bumbling way in this ideal of perfection. And uh, Santayana did a whole book on that called Platonism and the Spiritual Life. He said Platonism is fatal to the spiritual life because it puts down everything human beings do mm -hmm. as, as just a fa pale reflection of, of reality. He says this is the real world. And he called the ideal world uh, in, in a later series the, the realm of essence. Uh, you know, we have ideas. Uh, you know, threeness and threeness make sixness. Never mind fingers, I, I waved three fingers, but uh, uh, the, the abstract idea of threeness plus threeness makes sixness, or times threeness makes nineness. Now, he said the realm of essence doesn't do anything, it doesn't make anything, except as human beings entertain it. You know, we entertain mm -hmm. the idea, and we put three fingers to three fingers, and Lo and behold, we've got six. And this is absolutely true. It's a necessary truth. But unlike the Platonists, he didn't think that really did anything for you because, first of all, the mind had to be embodied. There, he didn't believe in disembodied minds or souls. Um, or in the realm of imagination. Do you know what a centaur is? Yeah, it's one of those mythical creatures. I always get those mixed up with mythical. Yes, uh, well, runs, runs around in forests and frightens people. In mythology, classic mythology, a centaur was half man and half horse. Uh, the man, uh, you know, from the bust, from the waist up, uh, and the horse from there on back. Now, Sandiana says, you, you entertain the idea of a centaur. You know what a centaur is. Now I do. <laughs> but a centaur doesn't exist nor does a unicorn or several of these other things. And he said, neither does threeness exist until you enumerate three things and name them. And don't mix apples and oranges, you know, mm -hmm. three apples or three oranges, or if you want to generalize, three pieces of fruit, an orange, an apple, and a pear, or 
something like that. Mm -hmm. But he said, these supernaturalists and religionists all take refuge, mm -hmm. they say, where did these abstractions come from? Where did these ideals come from? He said, it's a logical possibility, the permanent possibility of, of uh, thought and, and thing. And so in his m more metaphysical series, which was done between 1927 and 1940, um, he called it the realms of being. And he started off with this realm of essence, which doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, there are things that they may exist. Then he said, what really exists is the realm of matter. And he called himself a materialist. And he said, it isn't popular these days. And materialism is denounced in some circles where the thing and all its works are more, uh, most praised. And I've been st struck by the irony of that recently. These people who denounce materialism, and I heard a man on the radio doing it yesterday, the godless materialism of the Russians as against our godly <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> we got more things and more wealth and more material in that sense you see, in the godly countries mm -hmm. than those poor godless communists have right. managed to get. Uh, that's, that's a little bit of, that doesn't relate too much to Santayana because he lived in the Western world, but he lived very simply. And he believed that uh, matter then takes various shapes and forms. And he said, I leave it to the atomic physicists to determine the structure of matter. And even back here in 1906, when this book came out, uh, he said, uh, matter is energy, is life. The old uh, theologian said, hmm, matter is dead. Therefore, who breathes life into it? God. You know, you've got to have a miracle to bring. He said, matter is teeming with life. The atom is a little universe of, of energy all its own. And if we explore the secrets of the atom, we will learn more about the origins yes. of, of all kinds of things in our universe. So the realm of truth, which was his next realm, um, was the patterns that matter takes on as we perceive them. Uh, you know, I, I mm -hmm. see you in a very human shape there, Pat. <laughs> and, uh, Tonight, anyway. He would call that the essence of manhood or manness. <laughs> But it's embodied in, a partic in particulars, in you, mm -hmm. in me, in women, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, different uh, ethnic groups, different mm -hmm. nationalities, and so forth. And uh, his final realm, which didn't quite match these others in metaphysical status, was the realm of spirit. And he said, you know, when, when mind really starts reflecting on reality, that's what's important. When we value things, Mm -hmm. And value for him was what people do actually value, or any sentient beings actually value. None of these pl dead platonic ideals out there in the sky someplace. Values were living organic things as far as he was concerned. Yeah. So I, I find Santayana's system one of the most satisfying for me personally, yeah. besides the fact it's so beautifully written. Well, you know, that I, I can really see that because uh, I guess it's sometimes referred to as uh, naturalism. That, that yeah. perspective, and it seems to be a lot more coherent than, well, you, you hear a lot of uh, particularly fundamentalist Christian groups talking about things of the world, and they s are supposed to be bad, inferior. It uh, seems to be connected somehow with a, sort of a, almost a self-deprecating view of humanity, and uh, a philosophy such as Santayana or a lot of, a lot of the other uh, philosophers of that school seems to sort of bring, bring it together, the material world and, if you will, the spiritual world, which to me would be your, your concept of threeness could be also represented by the electronic uh, pattern in the memory of your calculator, and you press right. a button and up comes right. three, and you have an analogous function in your brain. You know, as a materialist, you can see, you can uh, believe the fact that these concepts do exist on a ma material realm, you can demonstrate that it's provable. It's falsifiable, also, uh, but th they don't. But you can't demonstrate their existence on any other plane. So it's, you know, I, I sort of wonder when I read philosophy and I, 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 you know, read a philosopher spinning his wheels for pages and pages on end, 
talking about something which to me is you know some sort of like beating at the air but but uh, Santayana was really in influenced by some other uh, Spinoza I understand was one of his his primary uh, Spinoza he liked as well as Aristotle he also you mentioned the touch of pessimism he didn't see everything as automatically progressing and he confessed that he liked Schopenhauer hmm. a great deal uh, the world is will and idea you know well, he actually lost a lot of his uh, younger friends from school. Mm -hmm. Apparently, these people, well, I guess the term they used to use was uh, melancholia. melancholia. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them committed suicide and met other untimely ends. And he, he seemed like in some of his novels, he tried to deal with this problem, I guess w what they call the spiritual aspiration in a void. Where, do you, where does a person go, really, spiritually, if you allow me to use that term, uh, given his realization, realization well, of the... You mentioned uh, his fiction. He wrote a uh, number of short stories, and then he, he tried a novel that came out in 1946. Uh, and oddly enough, it was the, a bestseller and the choice of the Book of the Month Club. And it sort of dramatized the split in Santayana's own cultural background because he called it the last Puritan. Now, he didn't mean that in quite the same sense that he meant that he's calling himself the last materialist, though mm -hmm. he wasn't the last materialist by any means. He meant the ultimate Puritan. And he had this prim New England character named Oliver uh, who decided on conscientious puritanical grounds that it was a mistake to be a Puritan. <laughs> <laughs> so he tried to, you know, I must live it up. You know, I must be more extroverted yeah. and outgoing. And then the foil to that was probably the other, other side of Santayana's own personality, the Latin Mario, who was a bombastic, impulsive Latin. Uh, and uh, people were genuinely surprised that this novel by the famous philosopher uh, was a, a bestseller. And he made the Book of the Month Club twice. I think the other one was, was his final book of essays, which he called Persons and Places. Mm -hmm. But he wrote on a wide range of subjects. I have another one that kind of fooled people. He did the idea of Christ in the gospel. And people said, ah, oh, Santayana has come back. <laughs> you know, he, he, he's come back to the church, in which he was never a member. Well, right? We discuss Christ, uh, Christ on this show sure. quite frequently. I mean, he thought highly mm -hmm. of the story of Jesus. He thought good role model for a lot of people, mm -hmm. but he never treated it as anything more than a leg legendary accumulation of fine stories about a person. Yes, he believed in the what was called the historicity of Jesus. He thought there was mm -hmm. such a man, but it, you could never tell from the Bible what was truth and what was fiction <laughs> and, and what was reported many years later by people who had never been there, mm -hmm. which was the way the Bible was written. Well, what would you, could you summarize for us just quickly, Jeff? This is one of the more challenging yeah. questions yeah. of the interview, but what do you think is really the thing that Santayana has to offer us today? Well, I would urge people to read him. If, if you're given to fiction, try The Last Puritan. If you're given to fairly heavy philosophy, and I've forgotten just how heavy some of it can <laughs> be, uh, try his Reason series, Reason, mm -hmm. The Life of Reason. Are, are Cliff Notes available for these books? Cliff, Cliff notes available Cliff for these notes. Are mo monarch notes available? <laughs> I, I doubt it. I don't think Santayana is that much taught. <laughs> uh, but uh, he, he composed a poem for his own death uh, called A Poet's Testament. And I've often used his poetry in conducting free thinking, humanistic, ethical society memorial services. And he put the challenge to all of us to try to live our lives so that those who live on after us may actually keep more than we take from them. And in a famous sonnet uh, in which he develops this idea, he winds it up, and I scarce know which part may greater be, what I keep of you or you rob from me. <laughs> well. And this was his, his only idea of immortality. That's, that's our immortality. Well, thanks a lot, Jeff. What we keep as against what is robbed. I appreciate you being our guest tonight, Jeff. Well, any question. I appreciate, I'm sure we all learned a lot about Santiana. I'm sure there's going to be a rush at the bookstores oh, now. Oh, uh, they'll, they'll all sell out. Thanks be, for being with us tonight on Free Thinking 101.
Once again, this is brought to you by the Rationalist Society of St. Louis. If you'd like to contact us, our address is P.O. Box 2931, St. Louis, Missouri, 63130. Phone number 298-6647.